afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. I heard that some of you applied to Cornell. Now that you're... All right, that's fine. Let's get on with our talk today. Okay. If I were to ask each of you to give me a piece of nutrition advice about how to, be, how to eat healthfully, what would you tell me? All right, you might tell me one of these things. Some people might tell me more fruits and vegetables, whole grain and water. That's usually what I tell people. But some nerds might start telling me, oh yeah, you need more fiber, fiber. I don't tell me this. Oh, and very specifically, a less saturated fat and trans fat because it really clogs up your arteries. And maybe some less carcinogens, whatever. But today's talk is really not about nutrition. And if I asked you, who knew to eat like that? Raise your hands. It's a little game. Just raise your hand. If you knew that you had to eat some fruits, vegetables, whole grain, crystal water. See, all of you guys know that. Keep your hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> who actually eats like that 50% of the time, at least? Alright, 75% of the time? Uh, all of the time. <laughs> you know what, I think I do 80% of time, but I do eat my crap, consciously. So let's try to learn to do that today. Oh, uh, sorry. That's knowing. So, in this research, there really is a clear disconnect between what we know what to eat, how to eat healthy, and what we actually do to eat healthy. And the reason might be that, you know, some people just didn't know that we have to eat more fruits and vegetables in order to be healthy, or less fat and sugar, right? But sometimes it might be a lack of skills, not knowing how to cook my vegetables properly in order for it to taste good. Or sometimes people lack the confidence to choose the correct food for dining out. Whatever the reasons are, this researcher has a different idea. Dr. Brian Wansink is a, a researcher from Cornell, and he has this book out there called Mindlessly Eating. He has a really interesting uh, research on the bottomless bowl, where the bowl sitting in front of the um, person taking the test in the study continuously keeps to be filled endlessly. And what they learned from the study was that people kept eating as much food as it was provided. So you can see what the huge implication this has on the number of calories we're eating. And his idea, his idea in mindless eating is that in order for us to eat fully mindfully is nearly impossible because we can't make each and every single eating decision on a daily basis three times at least a day. That we'd be really tired. So, you know why? because of all of these different triggers surrounding us while we, take, uh, while we go through our day. So in terms of, for example, in terms of portion size, that just means, like what I just told you with that study, the more I give you, the more you're going to eat. In terms of uh, eating partner, that means if we're eating together, I took a bite, you're likely to take a bite with me. And if I eat fast, you're likely to eat fast with me. And the rest of my uh, slides that you're going to see throughout this presentation, I will give you mostly examples from my work uh, at the John Tong Foundation, um, especially with my salt reduction project uh, that I was involved with. I will give you some examples about food placement, marketing advertisement, how price of foods influence what we eat, the convenience and location of foods and food policies. And here's one that you can't really see, but it says culture. Okay, this is um, the most researchy slide you're going to see, so let's take, take a little bit of time. This study involves um, the cafeteria. So imagine yourself going into the cafe. We have two lines. And one, line one, one, uh -oh. line one is the healthy one. In the healthy line, you see fruit, yogurt, and granola first. But if you are allocated to the um, unhealthy line, you're seeing cheesy eggs, potatoes, bacon first, and these unhealthy foods later. So what they found in this study was that those people placed um, in the healthy line, they were, a higher percentage of them chose the healthy foods. 
So this is about food placement. But for those people going through the unhealthy line, they chose the bad foods first. So you can sort of imagine how this could have implications on like your school cafeteria, maybe. Here, what do you see? <clears throat> can I just say a bad word, sort of? When I saw this ad, I was really pissed off. I was so pissed off that I called Coca-Cola. And I said, lady, you guys are selling that at, I think it was Da Rung Fa. And do you, do you know if that's, um, if you're going to be selling that for the rest from this day on, or is that just going to be a holiday special thing? Because I saw this when people were outside by Bai, you know, with a large number of packaged junk foods. Anyway, she said, I said, well, this has really bad implications for public health because, you know, Coke is not really healthy for your body. And she's like, so how's Coke not healthy for you? <laughs> that really irks me. But she actually said that. I said, oh, well, you know, like the caramel coloring that's sort of a carcinogen, and, you know, there's a lot of sugar in that. But the, my point was that instead of, instead of the regular 330 mil cans we see, they started making it in 500 mil containers. So what's the implication for that? Every time I open this can of soda, one per a person probably has to drink it in one sitting, right? Unlike the plastic bottle. So that means more calories consumed. You're like, oh, that's only 70 calories more. But then the calories add up on a daily basis. Here, I like to talk about policy, maybe a national policy. This was a photo taken at uh, one of our press conferences at the foundation talking about sodium reduction. Here you see different brands of corn chowder. And these numbers indicate the number um, of milligrams of sodium per serving of soup. So you see 250 all the way to 690. So if Taiwan were to implement a food policy indicating the maximum level of sodium that we could have in each of our food groups, let's say for the soups, Maybe it's, if it's set at 400, so that, that means we can lower our sodium in our daily diets. Is that right? What do you see here? It's a, it's a bunch of Chinese. I kind of learned that you don't really read Chinese too much. <laughs> I didn't when I first came back to Taiwan either. But this was a menu I took from a restaurant. Of all these different dishes, dish names, okay, here's jia chang, ru chang, you know, some eggs and vegetables, meat, blah, 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 blah. My point is, of the 68, 68 dishes you see here, only 13 were vegetable-based. So that's about 20%. What is this taught telling us? Maybe you're a Chinese culture, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, certainly American culture. We're very inclined to eat more meats than vegetables. But dietitians promote eating more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and water. So this is just telling us that our food environment surrounding us really makes it more difficult for us to choose the vegetables. They're hiding in there. So what's a better way of doing this? This is actually one thing I did with um, one of the restaurants we were working with during our salt reduction project. What I did was put all of the vegetable-based dishes together, and you put it up front. So same with that uh, cafeteria line study. If you put it up front, people are likely to see it first and they're likely to choose that first. So that's how we manipulate the environment. And this is another example from a hot pot restaurant. Tongming A B Shin. So for option one, uh, your meat plate is the same, your vegetable plate is the same. It's the regular, original version. But with version B, with your meat plate, you actually get 60% 60 60 more meat but your vegetables is cut down. So more meat, less veggies. And they call this smart. Oh, that pissed me off too. <laughs> All right, with this one, uh, I actually took this walking down the street, you know, with Family Mart. It's an entree dish special. What it's telling you is that if you pick, if you buy an entree for $10 more, you get to what? You get junk food. Okay, one of these sugar beverages or some pudding and it's a couple of thousand of moji. Twenty dollars, yay, you get a coffee, a soup, and a really phytochemical filled fresh apple. That is great. For thirty dollars more you get what? 
another more phytochemicals in your dry foods and this colorful salad. So, what's wrong with this? So, for dietitians, it's annoying too because it's making the food environment less healthy. And it actually makes eating healthy more expensive. But guess what? About eight months later, I found it online. For this, it's about the same idea. You know, you buy an entree, if you ten, pay $10 more, you actually get one serving of vegetables, about 65 grams. Ooh, that was my idea. No, I didn't, I didn't really tell them to do that. But it, was, it was my kind of idea that I'd love to see. But later, we had a meeting with Family Mars and heard that it didn't actually sell well. So that's too bad. And it's sort of a cost and demand idea. If more people were wanted to eat healthy and actually supported this idea and got as excited as me about it, but I don't shop in a convenience store, so I didn't buy this, you know, probably they would want to continue this more. What about this? You know, walking down the street, you get these um, lunch menus handed to you. And here, it really interested me because here it says um, a bowl of white rice or multi-grain rice. And guess what? For the same amount of money. Have you eaten at places where they make you pay more for the multi-grain or the brown rice? Yeah, the zhu tan, the self-serve um, like eateries. So this was really good, but one time when I went there and I asked for the multi-grain rice, they ran out. What's that story telling me? The food uh, service industry would probably tell you that, oh, we don't do the brown rice, it's more expensive, and also people don't like to eat them. But my experience told me that people ate them. And people, you think that people don't eat them, it's probably because you sell it at a higher price. Another example from my work. In this little eatery, there's a self-serve area for all the green onions, the peppers, and the vinegars, and all the condiments. Located in one central place, instead of on every table. You probably, you probably know what I'm going to talk about. So for some people, they're probably too lazy to walk the distance. Maybe it's like, I don't know, two tables down. You're like, oh, I'm in a hurry. I'm not going to go get the condiments. Whereas um, for some people, without seeing these triggers on their table, you might even think about getting using the condiments. So you can see that has implications for us reducing our sodium levels in our diet. As simple as that. Ooh, here Okay, this was a uh, picture taken by my colleague, and it was during the time when I was working on the salt reduction project. Here it reads, Guandongzhu broth is a high sodium food. For your health sake, we will not be providing it anymore from now on. I was happy, my colleague was happy about it. She's a dietitian too. But then I'm not sure if the students were happy about it. I'm just curious. As, uh, to who won in the end, you know? Like if, you, if they put it back because people were revolting or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah. This one, you can see that it's from the subway. What does that mean? It's a national chain restaurant. And if they did one thing like this, it could affect the diets of many, many people. What they did was that in order to do, they said they would increase sodium in our sandwiches. So they're not going to provide the salty olives and pickles anymore. Yeah, I'm sure they're saving money too, you know, from doing this. You can still ask for it, they just don't automatically put it in there. But then, you know, for some shy people, they probably, you know, I don't know, it's weird asking for people, asking, asking for things. Or, you know, for a lot of people, they probably didn't even realize that it's gone from their sandwich. <laughs> you know, it's really cool. Like, really cool. Alright, this is one of my last slides. And again, from Salt Reduction Project. And it's about sort of the marketing, you know, or their own management strategy. For my uh, vegetarian chow mein, I wanted less salt. We went to these restaurants during, during the project, so we were really focused on this. So I wanted my vegetarian chow mein less salt. And my colleague, she wanted her pho lighter flavored. And it was so, it was such a huge surprise to us. I actually went to the back of the restaurant and asked them, if I could have my receipt back, because I wanted to take this picture showing, showing you guys. But the point is, if they had this built into their post, you know, point of sale system, at the time of ordering, you know, you can see the little buttons. 
So it tells us that the food industry, food service industry, they're totally ready to take our, uh, to take their customers' customized re requests. Only if you knew that you wanted to reduce some of these sodium content, or if you wanted more vegetables, or however way you like your meals to be healthier. So, let's go back to the original question. How to eat healthy? Keep in mind your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and water. As simple as that. I don't count calories. I don't count my sodium content. All right? But then hopefully from my presentation, you know from, point, from this point on, you need to be a little bit mindful of your food environments because there's so many triggers that sort of attack your subconscious somehow. Thank you.